OK, so um, I'm starting five minutes after I'm supposed to have finished. Um, so I shall go fairly quickly. Um, I believe these are going to be available afterwards, aren't they, Mike, these presentations? Yes. Yeah, yeah so, so, so if I go too quickly, um, feel free at your leisure to look at the presentation later. So this looks at various things about the scheduler, um, starting off with Verilog, then System Verilog 2005, then System Verilog 2009. And some of the things you'll notice um, relate especially to things like if you'd actually use program blocks and clocking blocks, um, as well as how they interact with modules. So um, firstly, the, the, oops, sorry, the Verilog scheduler itself. Um, oh yes, of course, I've got a slot. Um, this is just a diagram of the traditional Verilog scheduler. It's got an active um, region at the top, which is where you um, make not a blocking assignment when you just make a blocking assignment with no delay. It's then got an inactive region um, where if you make an assignment with a hash zero, so a, a pound zero delay, it gets put into inactive. That can then cause things to happen which then get moved around again back to active. Then you've got the non-blocking assignment region. So the idea is that the non-blocking assignment region is what you typically use for clocked logic because you know that anything you're reading at a particular clock edge hasn't changed if you make non-blocking assignments. It's going to change in the future in the non-blocking region. And then on the, the right here, we've got um, the option of delaying things into future time slots by putting delays in. What am I doing wrong? I'm just being adjusted. Uh, sound, okay. Um, hopefully that's clearer. And then right at the end you've got this postponed region um, which relates to uh, dollar monitor. Dollar monitor writes out right at the end of the time slot. And then at the top you'll see it says from previous time slot and at the bottom it says to next time slot. So that was all in standard Verilog. Um, the main issue in Verilog was making sure you use non-blocking assignments at the right time to avoid any possible race um, between reading variables. So in system Verilog they tried to address various issues. Well, the first one was trying to make a safe connection between test environment and design. And the second one was system Verilog assertions and where they got evaluated and run. And then finally trying to get program blocks, clocking blocks and modules all to live in harmony. Um, so they tried to address these things by doing things to the scheduler. So the first bit looks at System Verilog 2005. Um, in 2005, the first thing is to look at assertions. So in assertions, they added a new region called observed, which is after the non-blocking assignment region. And the idea of that is that's where assertions actually run. That's where they, they evaluate. And then right at the top, you'll see there's the strangely named preponed region which I'm not sure if it's a word, but it is now, um, which is the opposite of postponed. And the preponed region is where assertion values are sampled. Now, most of the time, you don't particularly care about this. The one thing that can catch you out is if you trigger on a variable, that variable value, if you say at variable name, it will be sampled for assertion purposes right at the front. If you then look at its value, you're in the assertion, in the observed region, you'll be seeing the value right at the front, not any changes that might have occurred in between in the active and inactive regions. So you can sometimes confuse yourself by saying at reset and then reset is one and it isn't one because the at reset was sampled before it actually changed to one. So that's the only thing that catches you out. But that was the intention was to add two separate regions for assertions. Um, the next thing was the actual test bench related things. So they added a set of regions after observed but before postponed. So you can see them down the bottom, there's these reactive and re-inactive. And these uh, were originally designed to be used by programs. So the idea was that program code was guaranteed to run completely separately from the design code. All the design code would be running up the top, inactive, inactive, non-blocking, and then the um, program code be running down the bottom after the assertions are evaluated using reactive and reinactive. Um, the only sort of flaw in this scheme 
was that program code was allowed to make non-blocking assignments. And if that happens, that's what this red line here is showing, that program code could actually cause non-blocking assignment region to run again. And that was a potential danger because you could get an unpredictability between your design and test bench, which of course is what they were trying to avoid. And also um, that you could end up triggering the observed region again within that time slot. So you could go down to your program code, it could run, and then somehow you could end up with the observed region and a, an assertion being re-evaluated, which is a bit surprising. Um, so that was a sort of partial success in trying to solve the problem. Um, if you look at the programs versus modules, this is actually just saying what I've just said. I've run ahead of myself in my attempt to keep on time. Um, there's module and interface code running up the top. There's program code running at the bottom. If program code schedules using a non-blocking assignment, it can go back to the normal non-blocking region and potentially cause a problem. Um, for clocking blocks, clocking blocks were introduced to try and control various things inside System Verilog. One of them is they have strict rules about reading and writing. So in traditional Verilog, there's nothing to stop you mixing up reading and writing and accidentally writing to an output port inside your design. Sorry, reading an output port or writing an input port even inside your design. So they have strict rules about inputs and outputs in clocking blocks. But they were also designed to try and, again, operate in the reactive and reinactive region, these regions down here, to try and avoid clashing with the, the module-based code. So if you had a clocking event from your clocking block, so if you were triggering by your clocking block, and you made an assignment using this little arrow um, down the bottom, which is a clocking drive, it's not actually a non-blocking assignment, it's a clocking drive, um, that could either be scheduled into the future, in which case it would happen in a non-blocking assignment region in a future time slot, or it could be scheduled back into the current time slot if you used hash zero. So again, that's slightly dangerous that you can end up with a, um, a known unknown, as Donald Rumsfeld would have said, that's an area where something went wrong. If you look at clocking block inputs, the idea is that you can read inside a clocking block We've got three time slots shown here going from left to right. So we've got 165, 167, 170. Um, if I read something, I can read it with a delay. So I can specify down the bottom where it says input hash 5. I can say I want this to be sampled with a delay of five time units. And that will cause it to get sampled in the reactive region of 170 nanoseconds. So it's going to get sampled in the future. Also, I can say input hash one step. Hash one step is a magic value that was introduced in the standard. There's no such thing as hash two step. It's just a magic number that just means, or a magic keyword that means you're sampling in the pre-poned region, which is effectively the postponed region of the previous time slot. You're basically right at the sort of bitter end of the, of the time slot. And hash one step is a good thing. It's sort of, it's a good thing to use. It sort of samples right at the end of where you want to be. You could also attempt to use um, input hash zero, but that was dangerous because you can end up, it pushes you into reactive, which is kind of a good thing, but you can get in a mess if you have actual time delays. So, of course, people sometimes use clocking blocks for gate-level simulations where, or where you have actual time delays, and then you can end up in a mess because your sample before that time has passed. Again, I realize I'm going fast, but um, I'm trying to catch up a bit. So what did they do in 2009 and 2012? There weren't really any significant changes in 2012 related to, to scheduling and, and clocking blocks and programs and modules. Um, so the changes really came in in 2009. So the main thing they were concerned about was the fact that you've got this interaction between program blocks and clocking blocks going back into the non-blocking assignment region, which can cause races. So, of course, you won't be surprised to know that they added another region in the scheduler. Um, so I think the standard's now up to 17 or 18 regions in the scheduler. Um, so firstly, they were trying to make sure that if you were signed in a clocking block with a hash zero or a program, um, that that didn't trigger the observed region again. 
Secondly, if you use program blocks without clocking blocks, you're effectively the sampling using input hash zero, which is dangerous if you've got time delays in your actual chips, if you're doing gate level simulation at all. There's a potential race between clocking blocks and program blocks because they both use the region down at the bottom, the reactive, reinactive, and so on regions. And then in System Verilog 2005, they defined that you could wait for a clocking delay by setting up a default clocking block and then saying hash hash one. And that would be one event of that default clocking block. But unfortunately, it wasn't very well specified in 2005. So different vendors produced different implementations of what hash hash one actually meant. So in our courses, we've always recommended people just say at clocking block event um, to avoid getting in a tangle with hash hash one. So in 2000. And nine, right down the bottom, here's the new region. There's a re-NBA, and that's now where the clocking variable assignments, a little arrow that's actually a clocking drive, that's where that happens. And it's also where um, program block, uh, non-blocking assignments, if you see what I mean, program block arrow assignments are executed. So the good thing is that's now moved it out of the region where the design's running. Um, the bad news is that there's still a potential interaction or race between program blocks and clocking blocks. So there's another region. Um, the hash hash delays in 2005, as I was saying at the top of the slide, they're not that well defined. In 2009, they said, if you say hash hash one, if the delay is executed and it's not coincident with the clocking event of the clocking block, the calling process is delayed until the next clocking event. So imagine for some reason you've waited for a nanosecond, you then say hash hash one, you shift on, so one nanosecond relative to the clock, I should say, you then shift on to the next clocking block, uh, clocking event, sorry. Um, if you said hash hash zero, again, that wasn't well defined, well, it wasn't mentioned at all really in 2005. In 2009, they said, okay, it is okay to say hash hash zero. What it means is if you're coincident with the event, you won't wait, you'll just move straight on. If you're not coincident, you'll round up to the next clocking block event. So they tried to clarify that. It's in section 14.11 if you like reading standards, as I'm sure people do. Um, so that's what they tried to do. If you look in conclusion then, 1800-2009, 1800-2012 is actually better because that re-NBA region has clarified how things work. However, there's still some problems. Firstly, there's, I think, three places in the 2012 standard where there's a specific mention that a program block and a clocking block can be uh, a race. There can be a race between them. So watch out. Um, our experience of running System Verilog and UVM training is there aren't that many people using program blocks anymore. Most people are just using modules. Um, and clocking blocks together with modules, in which case there are no races as long as you use it all properly. Um, so that's the second point, that there are known races between clocking blocks and programs. For instance, see that page. Input hash zero on program without a clocking block is affected by non-zero device under test delays. So don't use input hash zero or a program block if you know you're going to be um, doing delays. In fact, it's Best not to use in hash, hash zero full stop, really. Um, you may notice changes if you use hash hash zero or hash hash one. So if you were using them in the past as procedural clock delays, you might notice they've changed now, um, especially if you were, had something like you had a small one nanosecond delay. You'll see it get rounded up definitely to the next clock age. That's what's supposed to happen. Um, modules and clocking blocks are now um, all um, well designed and they play nicely. So we always recommend people tend to use input hash one step for clocking block inputs and then um, specify a real input, uh, sorry, on the output, just use a, an actual delay that represents what they want to achieve. Um, there is, of course, a plan B, which is you can just avoid clocking blocks and programs completely and just do something like sample on the falling edge of your signals, which, of course, is what people always had to do in traditional Verilog. They had to avoid any race issues by um, jumping onto some other well-known time point. So you could just decide completely to ignore clocking blocks if you wanted to. 
Um, the danger with that is if you're giving your code to other people, you haven't encapsulated all the timing in a nice place. So if you're handing over your system very well environment to some design engineers and then they can start doing stupid things, whereas if you force them to use the clocking block, all the timing is well defined. Um, so sorry, that was a bit of a rush, um, 15 minutes. Um, any questions? There are no questions online. Um, do we have any questions from Andover, please? No questions. Thank you. And Grenoble? No question. Thank you. And Sophia? Oh, yes, I have a question. If you have uh, several environments and uh, different clocks uh, per, per environment, so one clock per environment, can you define a default clock uh, for each environment and use the double hash in each environment? Um, the, default um, the default clocking block works in the scope, so as long as you're in different scopes, you should be able to define the default clocking block in each environment. You can definitely have multiple clocking blocks, yeah. And to use a double, double hash also? Yeah, the double hash would apply within the scope of the default clocking block you defined. So in System Verilog 2005, you had to declare a default clocking block in a local scope. There was no way of sort of making it outside some other scope. In 2009, there is a global default clocking block which you can define that applies to lots of scopes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. That's lovely. Thank you very much. I don't think there are any more questions from Bristol. Okay. Thank you.